Well, hello, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, I look forward to coming. I've come all the time, and um, you know, it's really me and the other investigators that come that are. Uh, can we just turn that down a little bit? I'm getting a. The bright light is. I can't really see beyond. The, oh, it's much better. Um, for myself and the other investigators that have come, this is our learning. Not just today, but in clinics, we are learning. I'm not an expert in HSP and PLS. You guys are experts in HSP and PLS. And you are teaching us, the medical scientific community. We're taking notes. We should be. Now, uh, One thing that we don't, that I don't do, is to uh, give, express appreciation for the people that make this possible. And I, I'm not going to mention, thank everybody, because I'll leave some people out, and that wouldn't be, you know, it would be uh, not appropriate. But I do want to mention uh, Chris Borchini for her continuous support of this organization and this meeting. We wouldn't be here. And I do want to mention Frank Davis, who's really just a steadfast leader of this foundation. And the foundation would not be making the strides it is making without his leadership. So I'm grateful, and I recognize that. I just want to mention that. Now, earlier today and, and yesterday, we heard a lot of specifics about um, HSP and PLS and treatments and networks and what we need to do to move forward towards uh, therapy. I'm going to speak more in generalizations. Uh, and because the reason I'm doing that, let's see, I think I've lost my screen here. The reason I'm going to do that in generalizations, I think I can probably figure it out, is because I'm really speaking to three, in, um, I'm giving three, there are three audiences. One, OK, thank you. This time out. OK, OK. There's um, individuals and families that have HSP that I'm, I want to speak to. And, that's, and, and then there's the uh, medical community and the scientific community. And I guess, I guess four is there's the leadership of HSP and PLS research and foundations. I, I have a message. I'm speaking in different tones and different for all of these, the medical, the scientific, the families, individuals, leadership. And so I really, I'm, I'm covering a, a lot of topics in, in kind of a, a high altitude way, but I entertain any question at any level from anybody. Let's get started. I want to say one thing. Every time I talk, people ask for an update in HSP and PLS, and I don't think that's acceptable. I think, we, I think everybody who talks about HSP and PLS should be charged with how to make a transition to therapy. It's not acceptable to just say what the current state of knowledge is. We need to know, and how will that current state of knowledge help make there be treatment? That's what we want to do. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. This is uh, an outline, and the uh, reason I'm showing this slide is because I have heard feedback that there is no outline, and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to talk about when I get up here. But I just want to tell you, that's not the case. I have figured out what I'm going to say, and this we're going to talk about, more or less. So we're going to talk about the process of drug development. We're going to talk about, and very important, I want to start the topic that we have, we now, I mean investigators, have biases about what we consider PLS is, what we consider HSP is, and these biases shape our research agenda. We need to be, we need to recognize bias and be as objective as we can. Um, because the do there, the, there's, uh, we'll talk about dogma versus reality. Now, there have been a lot of gene discoveries 
not just HSP, but also PLS. And we'll talk about some very general concepts about what these protein discoveries mean and, and how we can use that information for advancing treatment. I'll talk about four potential treatment targets. This is a general approach. And then I'll have a, present a short list of a, a short to-do list and then some recommendations. Now, this is um, how we approach treatment. And uh, we start with, I don't know if I, this, let's see. I don't know if this works, whatever. Well, you got the idea. We start with clinical and pathologic features. So somebody with uh, HSP, for example, has trouble with their legs, the legs are tight, the legs are weak. On a neurologic examination, we localize those symptoms to involvement of the upper motor neurons, primarily the cortical spinal tracts, and that's what the examination tells us. And then uh, at, in, in uh, autopsy studies, and there have been very few autopsy studies in hereditary spastic paraplegia, 15, maybe. Uh, and certain, now there are more than 80 genetic types of hereditary spastic paraplegia, and so we don't know the autopsy studies in all 80 types. Um, so, but from what we, from the limited amount of autopsy studies, um, we see pathologically where there is nerve degeneration, and that correlates with the clinical features. And from those two um, pieces of information, we get a hypothesis that says the upper motor neurons and the dorsal columns, which are um, sensory fibers in the spinal cord, are selectively vulnerable to whatever the abnormality is in HSP. Now, 15 years ago, um, I actually wrote a paper, and I said, well, you can distinguish HSP from PLS because HSP has dorsal column involvement and PLS does not. And uh, we can prove that or show that by uh, looking at somatosensory evoked potentials that measure dorsal column function and they're abnormal in HSP but they're not abnormal in PLS. Well, that's not true. I mean, that lasted, that, that proclamation, that dogma then lasted about 18 months until somebody said, no, many people with PLS have dorsal column involvement clinically uh, on exam or with somatosensory evoked potential testing. Uh, so uh, the point is, is that um, but whether it's upper motor neurons exclusively or primarily or upper motor neurons and dorsal columns, we have the concept of selective neuron vulnerability. Not all, the entire spinal cord is not degenerating. It's selective nerves within the spinal cord. Selective neuron vulnerability. And from this, originated the concept that it was the ends of the long nerves, the long motor nerves, the long sensory nerves, that made that particularly degenerated. All right, I'm just going through this. This is now we're at selective neuron vulnerability. So we start to think, what is unique about these nerves? Well, they're long. So what, 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 uh, what, what um, unique physiology or molecular functions or cellular processes would make long nerves vulnerable and short nerves not vulnerable. And we start thinking, oh, well, what about axon transport and start fast axon transport and things that are need to maintain the health and longevity. These are nerves that are, you know, uh, quite long, going from the brain down to the bottom of the spinal cord. They are formed in utero. They grow out to the, uh, through the spinal cord and they don't replace themselves. So they're there for life. And, and what would make them vulnerable? What, what the only thing we, would, we stopped our thinking at was they're long. That's about as far as we went with that concept. I am say we, I mean the research community. We said, well, they're long. Yeah, you know, we really haven't progressed much beyond that 1968 concept that they're long. But, you know, there's a lot of other differences in their physiology and their neurochemistry but we haven't yet incorporated all of that last 40 years of neuroscience into the biology of those neurons, which the, the biology of those neurons has advanced, but we haven't taken advantage yet 
of all that information about the, their biology except their length. So we say, well, it's something about them, them being long. Yeah, I think we need to move beyond that. But So when we start talking about selective neural, uh, neuron vulnerability, we start to postulate mechanisms or, or attributes of these nerves that are selectively vulnerable. We say, well, their length is one, for example. We start to postulate molecular mechanisms. I mentioned one, axon transport, but there are many others. Now, then we take gene discovery. And this has exploded. And it continues to explode. I mean, I made a list two weeks ago of 60 genes for HSP, and it's already out of date. Um, so I know we're at least 61. Um, so a lot of genes. Gene discoveries tell us a lot of things, but it tells us 60 plus, and in the case of uh, PLS, half a dozen, seven, eight genes, molecular pathways, that if they're disturbed, these selective neurons degenerate in a particular way. It lets us develop animal models, and from this we can start to, we have the resources, the animal models and the cell culture models, the in vitro models, we have the resources and we have the ideas to start developing treatments. Okay, now, I've pre presented this slide before, here, but I want to emphasize one difference in this slide, and that is this is not the only way to establish treatment. This is now, we, this, is, this is a mechanistic approach. This is an approach to treatment based on understanding the molecular pathophysiology. But this is not the only way to establish treatment. So this has been what we presented as, here is how we're going to march towards treatment. But let's be clear, this is not the only way to establish treatment. There are other paths to treatment. Now, I list here um, the mechanistic one that I just discussed, and that's worked very well. You know, when you, when you figure out how to stop HIV, AIDS virus, well, it needs to replicate, it needs a receptor to get into the cells and so forth. You understand molecularly, mechanistically, what it needs to enter the cell and how it replicates itself. You can develop drugs based on those mechanisms to antagonize those mechanisms. That's worked very well. When Parkinson's disease, when it became apparent that um, there was a, a dopamine deficiency, the concept was let's replace dopamine. That's worked very well for symptomatic treatment of Parkinson's, not to stop the ongoing degeneration. So forth. Antibiotics development. So it's largely on a, um, well, it has become largely on mechanistic. So cancer treatments, largely mechanistically driven, very successful. Okay, but there are other ways. Let's talk about serendipitous drug discovery. Okay, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands about people taking antidepressants, too much information, but antidepressants are one of the most widely prescribed medicines uh, after Tylenol in the United States and, uh, and, and Lipitor. But um, antidepressants, the first generation antidepressants were discovered completely by accident. This is uh, people in, um, in, uh, chronic, in institutions uh, um, who had, um, were being treated for uh, tuberculosis. And the drug that was used seemed to produce euphoria. It was being used for tuberculosis as an antibiotic. And it was observed to produce euphoria. This is in the 50s. So people observed it and they said, well, what if we gave that euphoria producing drug to people who had depression? And so that drug was used and there was some mood altering effect and that started the um, antidepressant revolution and also revolutionized the concept that uh, depression was uh, biochemical, or at least could be caused by biochemical abnormalities. Before there was a chemical approach so not only, did it, it, not only did it revolutionize the treatment for many people, not everybody, but it also revolutionized the concept of depression. And it was an accidental discovery that was then capitalized on by further mechanistic um, analysis. Okay, now the other thing I want to mention is this, uh, is combination treatments. 
And combination treatments is not really the same as a pathway per se, because you have to have more than one treatment and use them together. But um, uh, combination treatments has revolutionized, has made HIV a treatable condition. The fact that multiple agents are used simultaneously. And, and uh, combination treatments, going back into the late 40s, early 50s, was really the start of the revolution of childhood leukemia treatments. It was combination treatments. So uh, we, ha we, we do not want to minimize that, imp and, uh, that important aspect that medicines may need to be used or other treatments, whether it's medicines and gene therapy or medicines and physical therapy or whatever our imagination takes us, the treatments may need to be done in combination to get maximal effect. Okay, now, what about empiric trials of repurposing treatment? Well, we've already been doing that with Ampira. You know, Ampira prescribed, as we heard about earlier uh, this afternoon, uh, um, we've been prescribing Ampira. Many, uh, many people throughout the world and the country have been prescribing Ampira for people with HSP and PLS. And, uh, you know, once in a while it helps. Mostly, it, it, mostly there's very little benefit, if any, but occasionally there's somebody who benefits, and it's worthwhile trying sometimes. Uh, but the point is, um, we need to uh, embrace empiric the, the empiric trials of repurposing medications, medicines that seem to help spinal cord injury, medicines that seem to help Parkinson's. I'm just mentioning, I don't, I'm not, not based on our, mech, not based on, necessarily based on mechanistic insights. Okay, for example, there's a new agent uh, being tried now for uh, primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Would that be useful? Um, I just lost my thing again, but let's see if I can get it back. Don't, I, I'm, a, I'm a professional, I can do this. Maybe not. Don't panic. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, so, um, okay. Um, all right, so would that medicine that's being tried now in primary progressive MS uh, be useful in, in uh, primary lateral sclerosis? Well, initially, we'd say, oh, well, PLS, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis is an immune-mediated process, and PLS is not, and so uh, we would we would not include it on a theoretical mechanistic basis. Um, I'm not sure that we want to do that. I don't know that we know enough about the, the pathophysiologic mechanisms of PLS to, to say a priori this medicine has no benefit. Now we would consider the likelihood of benefit versus the possibility of risk and there, some medicines may be extremely risky and of low probable benefit, and so we might want to hold them off until the risk profile was more permissive. I'm not, I'm not arguing for this particular medicine. I'm just saying in general terms, we need to think about um, repurposing medicines. Uh, examples, um, anticonvulsants are widely used to treat uh, migraine, and they're widely used to treat, um, some are widely used to treat uh, chronic pain or tremor or bipolar disease. These are anti-epileptic medicines. And why are we using them? Because they work. Not because they are, uh, because we think that uh, um, there's a strong mechanistic molecular uh, similarity. There might have been some theoretical similarity, but we're, they're largely used because they seem, they're not outstanding in their uh, efficacy, but they do offer many hundreds of thousands of people benefit. Now, what about crowdsource trials? What do I mean by that? The, uh, this is something that I, I think we need to start moving in this direction. And that is the, you know, it's particular for PLS. PLS is more rare, obviously. We heard about the numbers estimated 1,000 people in the country. Um, uh, so the, the challenges are greater for PLS. Now, let's talk about childhood leukemia. 
there are many different types of childhood leukemia. Some of them are extremely rare. And in, in general, for some types of leukemia or lymphoma, a, a clinician may only see one or two children, for example, with that type of leukemia in their professional career. So some types of leukemia are extremely rare. Now, how yet the treatment of childhood leukemia has been transformed from previously largely almost universally fatal to now very high rates of cure, exceeding 70%. And how do you treat a condition in which each, basically each person is, has it their own condition and is extremely rare? Well, they have, uh, this is my term, the crowdsource trials. I don't know what term they use, but they employed a, a way that every treating uh, hematol uh, pediatric hematology oncologist could report the trial and the medication combination that they were using in their office. And this all became centralized and reported at meetings. And there were standard reporting, um, relatively standardized reporting and analysis and, and so forth. And so somebody in Manitoba would ha have a trial and somebody in Paris would treat a patient and somebody around the world, San Diego, you get the idea, and this information was collected. This is before the internet. Okay, well, we need to do this too. Because anybody who's treating primary lateral sclerosis, we need to say, what's working in, in your patient? What are the attributes in this individual? What kind, does it really PLS? What criteria do they have? We need to have standardized analysis, standardized reporting, and standardized and, and centralized data collection preserving anonymity, and we got to work out the details. But this is a, what we call a crowdsourced trial. This are, these are empiric trials occurring in treating physicians' offices. They're, they're, it's not a trial in the sense it's an experiment. It's reporting anecdotal, collective anecdotal experience. And then this can be taken forward as a, as a blinded trial or it, in a formal trial mechanism. OK, so now, which approach should we use? Which one of these? Should we do the mechanistic one only? The old school, find the molecular problem, fix the molecular problem. What should we do? Should we follow the, uh, just wait for some happy accident uh, in the discovery? This is that, uh, uh, this uh, review of the uh, serendipitous discovery of antidepressants. Well, I think we need to look at every treatment strategy together. I think we need, wh whatever is possible, we need to pursue. And uh, I, don't, I don't think we, that one approach uh, alone, uh, we, we need to rely on one approach alone. I think we should, we should use many approaches, different approaches. Now, let's talk about um, the biases that, uh, we, that investigators bring to the research. And the point is, is that historical generalizations about HSP and, P HSP and PLS mechanisms became a dogma and some of this dogma, and this dogma definitely in, uh, uh, directs research hypotheses, and some of this dogma is false. Okay? Now, I'm not speaking just to people here. I'm speaking to investigators. To, the people need to be free and recognize the, free of these, uh, this dogma, and recognize um, how it influences the research. First of all, uh, PLS subjects very rarely have affected relatives. And this is the observation. And therefore, we say PLS, unlike HSP, is a non-genetic condition. And so what causes non-genetic neurologic degeneration? Well, viruses, toxins, dietary deficiencies, I don't know. Lots of things. We haven't figured them all out. But we're starting, we're going to look for those non-genetic conditions because the dogma says that PLS is not due to a gene mutation. And, um, um, everybody has heroes, and one of my heroes was uh, Dr. Roland, um, Bud Roland, and he just died this year, and he was past president of the American uh, Neurology, or American Academy of Neurology, and professor at Columbia University. And I met with him at a PLS meeting in um, California that um, uh, Craig and Linda Ventner, uh, Gentner um, uh, established. 
And uh, he asked me, he said, well, if you discover a gene mutation in PLS, that means it's a genetic condition. And I said, yeah. And that means that it's going to be a form of HSP at that point, because we have the concept that if it's a gene-caused problem, we have, they have the concept at that point that PLS is a non-genetic condition. And so if we find a gene in PLS, that means that that person actually has HSP. And so we're, ne we're never going to permit PLS to become a genetic condition, because every time we find a genetic, if we did find a, gen a gene mutation in PLS, it's that person is actually representing HSP and so forth. So we, we had this concept that, no, PLS is not a genetic disorder. And that was, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, a long time ago. Well, that's dogma, and it's not true. Um, the reality is that if you do gene analysis in people with primary lateral sclerosis, even if they don't have a family history, and the vast majority don't have a family history, sometimes you find gene mutations. Okay, now this has been, this is a very important because it says that, first of all, some people have gene mutations and some people don't. So that means that there are, not everybody's the same, even if they have the same symptoms. So that means now there's at least two types. Some people have a mutation and some people don't. So PLS then is not a disease per se, it's a syndrome with different types, just like HSP is a syndrome with different types. The first time this was identified was actually in children with the juvenile PLS the uh, ALS2 gene at the bottom of the list, ALSIN, uh, discovered by Dr. Sadiq, who spoke last year. And uh, so that's the recessive form of PLS, and mutations in the same gene also cause a recessive form of ALS. Now, uh, it's interesting because we and, and uh, Dr. Sadiq and others have seen children that look just like the published uh, reported children with juvenile PLS with, with Alsin mutation, we've sent the gene analysis and they don't have any mutation there. Which means that even within the juvenile PLS, there's now some people with the Alsin mutation and some people without the Alsin mutation. So it, there's other causes there. But anyway, the bottom line is there are a number of genes that have been identified in fairly low number of, but still it's an important concept, of people with PLS. So these genes also have been identified in other conditions. So let me just hone in on two. One is paraplegian. We and two other groups have identified people with classic PLS who have mutations in the paraplegian gene. Mutations in the same gene also cause SPG7 hereditary spastic paraplegia. Okay, uh, there, there are genes, mutations that are associated with the, the, uh, the uh, C9-ORF mutation is associated with PLS or frontal temporal dementia or ALS and so forth. And, and you can go through this, including the Parkin2 gene mutation, which has been associated with Parkinsonism. So kind of a stretch. I was surprised to read about that. This is, uh, from a neurologic standpoint, that's a different distribution of uh, neurologic involvement. Okay, however, so this says that with the old concept was that PLS is not a genetic condition. Well, we have to modify that and say PLS is A, not a single uh, condition, but a group of conditions. That's one thing, that's an important advance. And second, in some people there are identified mutations. Now, we say right now that's only a minority of subjects with identified mutations. But let's be clear, the genetic analysis, a negative uh, report on a gene analysis does not mean there are no mutations. It means that no mutations were found by that um, gene analysis technique. And current techniques are not exhaustive, um, even for $2,000. Even if you do a whole genome sequencing for, I don't know how much that is, a lot. They're not exhaustive. Uh, exome sequencing specifically 
the one that's more affordable, uh, although very expensive, does not detect all mutations. It detects only, it, for, uh, it, it won't find, for example, mutations in non-coding or regulatory regions. And we know of many genetic diseases that where the mutation occurs in a non-coding or regulatory region, but most of the commonly used uh, exome sequencing techniques do not find those type of mutations. So um, we, if we looked at um, a spastic paraplegia panel of 60 or 70 genes and found no mutations, it would not exclude a mutation in a gene known to cause the disease that affected the regulation of that gene. Okay, and what, we're, what we mean is this. Let's imagine if you have a, an orchestra of 100 instruments. And uh, the uh, flute is broken. So when it comes time for the flute solo, every time it's supposed to play a certain note, it comes out squeaky because the flute is broken. That's like a sequence mutation. But let's say there's a regulation, and when it comes time for the flute solo, the flute plays so loud or so soft, but the volume is wrong. It's perfectly in tune, it's perfectly in time, it's just too great a volume. Well, it would be wrong as well. The volume or the abundance of the, uh, the regulation of the amount of gene transcription is not well studied in the current exome sequencing techniques. We're just not sensitive to, th there are ways to study that, but when we do clinically available, commercially available, testing, that is not included. Um, the other part is that we find sequencing variants that we don't know what they mean. And uh, so this is that we have to guard ourselves from saying of uncertain significance means no significance. We don't know that. We also have to be careful about benign variations because in, uh, it's well established in bacteria and cell cultures that some benign variations affect the abundance or stability of the, D, of the RNA transcript, the, you know. And uh, so they don't affect the protein function, but they do affect the abundance of the protein. We have to be careful about that. But there are techniques we can do to get comprehensive or more, but some of these are not available clinically. Like, for example, RNA profiling. Where we study the abundance of all these genes. And now there are 28,000 genes or something. So that's a big study. It's not available clinically. It's available in a, in a lab. We could do that um, to, to, uh, to measure the regulation. But, you know, um, uh, there are additional sequencing. My point is, is that when we say PLS mutations are only in a minority, but they're only in a minority in the way the sequencing was done. Comprehensive or more comprehensive genetic analysis may need to be done as well. And I'll show you an example. Oops, something went wrong here. Uh, okay, hang on. I'll show you an example about uh, where exome sequencing failed to find a mutation and, and whole genome sequencing did find a mutation. I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, another part about the, the dogma is that um, the uh, HSPs and, uh, were considered to be due to the degeneration of the long nerves, and this had to do with their length. And this was a central nervous system axon degeneration of the longest axons. That's the dogma. This is the central dogma. You've heard it this morning, and if you go online, you'll read it many times. Um, the, and uh, we say the central dogma of HSP and PLS is that it's a length-dependent central nervous system axon degeneration affecting the longest motor and longest sensory nerves, and they are affected because of their length. That's the dogma, and this is the reality. The reality is that um, there's a lot of neurodegeneration in HSP and in PLS that is not predicted by the length of these nerves. So there are many types of HSP that have, well, some types, for instance, have retinal degeneration. Some types have cognitive degeneration, cognitive impairment. Some types have um, uh, ataxia or other nervous system problems that you wouldn't predict because the nerves are long. So, uh, and these, uh, these other 
um, involvements can occur in the same person or due to the same gene mutation that also causes the impairment of the long nerves. So I think we have to say that the, this concept of selective vulnerability, which has guided our dogma and our search for treatments, we need to be somewhat skeptical that, that, is, that that's perfectly accurate and complete. Now, I do want to just mention that uh, we say that there's uh, HSP causes weakness and spastic weakness. That's in the name, spastic paraplegia. But some people, the paraplegia meaning profound weakness, but some people are not weak. Okay, not weak at all. Or some people are only minimally weak. Uh, and occasionally, I've seen two people with this in the past few months, children, um, who don't have spasticity, well-established HSP mutations, known to be pathogenic, who are floppy. So the concept um, that HSP always causes weakness, that's not true. Sometimes it, I mean, it often causes weakness. I don't want to escape that. Often causes, usually causes some weakness, but not always. Usually causes some spasticity, but not always. And some people only have, or mainly have spasticity when they're moving. And we talked about this the other day, um, but we've seen this in a, that is when you examine someone at the bedside and move their legs around, there may be minimal spasticity, but they get up to walk, it looks like a lot of spasticity, but we can't really measure yet, haven't figured out how to measure spasticity when someone's moving. And in neurology terms, we would think that exertion-dependent increased muscle tone, that's a extrapyramidal Parkinson's dystonia problem, but um, that spasticity is usually not exertionally dependent increased muscle tone. So we have, we have to re reconsider um, the, all of the, uh, what we uh, imagine the uh, neurologic basis of this increased muscle tone that's act only with activation of the movement. Okay, now, um, the other part is HSP is not always a degenerative condition. Degenerative means everything was formed normally and then becomes unraveled. But HSP sometimes is, is not a degenerative progressive problem. Sometimes, not uncommonly, it begins before uh, age one to two, the ch a child is walking on their toes and they continue to walk on their toes. It doesn't get any worse, doesn't get any better, doesn't go away. Um, it's, it looks like cerebral palsy and there are a number of childhood onset forms that look like that, that are non-progressive, and we think are developmental, not degenerative processes. So if we say HSP is a progressive degenerative process, well, we gotta hold on. We gotta say often, but not always. Okay, um, and uh, so I just wanna mention one other part, two other parts is that HSP very often is not limited to the central nervous system. As I say, there are 80 genetic types and probably 25% of them, or 20 different genetic types or so, have involvement of the peripheral nerves uh, as well. And we have not yet figured out, we have not resolved, if HSP in each of these many 80 different types is due to an intrinsic problem of the neuron or of the supporting, nurturing glia. It could be in Type one, it's a neuron problem, and type two, it's a glia problem. We don't really know yet for every type where the underlying, which cell type ha has the primary problem. I mean, if, it's, if the supporting cell, the glia, the surrounding myelinating cell that surrounds the axon, if that is a problem, then the um, underlying uh, axon or the enwrapped axon could uh, be dysfunctional, and the other way around. An axon problem can cause a myelin problem. Okay, so we're gonna just show that this list, and this is, I say, say is 60 genes for HSP, and uh, Dr. Brastad mentioned uh, maternal inheritance, and there's one mitochondrial gene listed here. So there are many dominant genes identified, many genes for dominantly inherited HSP, many genes for recessive HSP, X-linked HSP, and at least one gene for uh, mitochondrial disorder um, that causes a form of HSP. And I circled the one on the bottom, this uh, Paul R3A, 
only to say that it causes the recessive form of HSP was not picked up on exome sequencing, but was in a, uh, an intronic mutation identified by whole exomes, by whole genome sequencing. So when I said before that a negative result on exome sequencing doesn't mean there are no mutations. Well, we know that at least one type of HSP was discovered in this way. Okay, now what have we learned? Well, uh, when we started this process, we thought, well, since everybody has uh, spasticity and some degree of weakness, and as I say, not, uh, the degree of weakness, degree of spasticity can be variable, we thought, well, when we find an HSP gene, we'll know a class, a molecular process, and we'll predict that other genes will be in the same cellular process or the same uh, biochemical process. Uh, that's not really true. What we've learned is that there are, I mean, there are a lot of genes and that, that, that there are a lot of different molecular abnormalities, many different molecular abnormalities that all cause, ultimately, the symptoms of spastic weakness in the legs. And some of the, and I've just drawn schematically here eight or so, um, uh, however many different uh, clusters like uh, Axon transport is abnormal in at least three types of HSP genes. And uh, protein misfolding is, is, a, is a feature of at least three or four more HSP genes. And mitochondrial abnormalities are, are, are features of at least three HSP genes. So what we know is that if you disturb the mitochondria in a particular way, you can get HSP. If you have uh, axon transport problems in a particular way, you can get HSP. What we don't know is how these are related. For example, we don't know if protein misfolding causes an axon transport problem, and because the axon transport of, 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 of substances around the cell can't move the mitochondria, well then there's a energy depletion in a certain part of the cell, and then you get HSP. We don't know if these, if these primary biochemical problems ultimately converge. We haven't figured that out yet. But here's a couple of generalizations about HSP proteins. One, they have many diverse functions. So let's talk about spastin. Uh, I don't know if I have, okay. Um, spastin, for example, as uh, Dr. Brasted mentioned, is the uh, single most common type. Mutations in spastin are the single most common cause of dominantly inherited HSP. Um, it's not the most common cause of HSP, but among dominantly inherited HSP, um, three out of 10 people with dominantly inherited HSP have mutations in spastin. Seven out of 10 don't have mutations in spastin. They have you know, one of a number of many different gene mutations, but it's the single largest one. At any rate, so spastin, uh, is, involved in, is involved in binding to microtubules. I'm not going to go into detail. And it is involved in severing microtubules and breaking them. And uh, it's involved in, and, and so microtubules are sort of like uh, the established train tracks down this, they're structural. And uh, when you want to move cargo, the cargo is moved down the microtubules. And when there's a growing part of the cell, well, there, it's the, the axon will lay down microtubules and then transport cargo to the growing end. And when another part of the cell is growing, it will pull up those tracks and redeploy the microtubules. And spastin's involved in breaking down the microtubules that permits them to be redeployed in another part of the cell. Okay, so spastin binds microtubules and severs microtubules. Spastin's involved in joining microtubules to the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a network that transports um, uh, chemicals uh, throughout the cell, proteins throughout the cell. Spastin binds microtubules, joins it to the endoplasmic reticulum, breaks down microtubules. Spastin's involved in um, axon transport. Spastin's involved in um, the unfolded protein response. I don't want to go into detail, but uh, the unfolded protein response is necessary for the, um, to break, when a cell wants to uh, uh, recycle its, uh, its chemicals, its proteins specifically, they are broken down and uh, 
and spastin participates in that. So we have at least four functions of spastin. And the point is, is that some spastin mutations disturb its microtubule severing, but not all pathogenic mutations of spastin disturb its microtubule severing. So when we say, well, how does spastin work? Well, we know there are at least four functions of spastin. I mean, if you say, which is the primary function of a pencil? Is it the writing or the erasing? I don't know. I mean, it depends what you want to do. They each could be considered the primary function. So spastin has a number, and every HSP protein, essentially, not every, but in a general term, they, the majority of them have, more, have multiple functions. Okay, so not when you say we've got these 60, 80 proteins now, 60 proteins, now we know what they do, we can find treatment. Well, we've got more than 60 molecular processes. Okay. Did you get all that? Let's talk about potential treatments. Four potential treatment targets. Certainly we can treat the disease. Pro I mean, these are just broad brush strokes. I'm not going to lay out a, a research agenda. We can treat the disease process. Okay. So, let's say, uh, as I mentioned, the spastin has four functions. Um, it's involved in the unfolded protein response. Let's, di let's direct treatment that can normalize the unfolded protein response. I understand that I'm not going into, dis because of time right this minute, into describing the unfolded protein response. Just bear with me. But it's one of spastin's functions, and it's, and, or, or we could talk about uh, this microtubule severing. The people have touted for 10 years to try agents like vinblastine or vincristine. These are, are, an, are anti-cancer drugs that bind to microtubules. They say, well, spastin severs microtubules, and this drug has the word microtubule in its mechanism of action. So let's try it. Um, so uh, we, should we target therapies at the specific molecular abnormality that we've learned from the gene identification? That's one target. Okay, which cells should we target this treatment in? All cells? The mutation, after all, is present in all cells. Or should we target it in the cell? Which is it, if, it's, if it's dysfunctional because it's occurring in neurons, we should target neurons, or should we target glia, or should we target everything? Should we say, well, we don't really know what all of these functions do, but if we put the normal gene in, well, it's going to do all of the functions. So let's not bother with uh, understanding and developing treatments for the 14th uh, function of this identified protein. Let's just put the gene in, because it's going to do all of, the, the normal protein is going to do all of the functions, right? So the first approach to treatment is to treat the disease process as we've learned from the gene identification. Another process that we is not given that much attention in this audience, but it is around the world, is to treat the degenerative process. By that I mean, if we ignoring the concept that some forms of HSP are developmental, not degenerative. Oh, geez. Um, Maybe they're, I think they're doing that because I'm running over time. Hang on. If we just talk about the degenerative forms of PLS and HSP, what we're talking about, the concept of neurodegeneration, and this would be a, a seminar about neurodegeneration. Um, neurodegeneration is something triggers the cell to degenerate. It could be a toxin. It could be a gene mutation. It could be a trauma. A, a, a vitamin deficiency, whatever. Many different things induce nerve degeneration. When the, the, so there are things that induce nerve degeneration. In this case, the initiating factors are gene mutations. Um, and then there, the cell, it, it's not that the cell, the uh, neuron, just falls apart. It's, the cells don't just fall apart. They're taken apart. The the uh, elements of the cell, the membranes, the proteins, they're all, it's disassembled. They don't just fall apart. Like a, like a building would fall apart in a, in a hurricane. No, it's that the, the, there's a disassembly process that moves and recycles the protein and lipids as much as it can, depending on if the cell is dying or not. But if the cell is not dying, then there's a, 
a fairly structured um, way that the cell is taken apart. That's what we mean degeneration. Degeneration is a sequence of disassembly. Unless the cell, as I say, is dying, that's another story. Um, but cell death is not a big issue, I mean, it's not the primary problem in, in HSP and PLS. There is some, but we're not talking about that. Um, and then there are, so there's things that initiate degeneration, there's things that accomplish degeneration, and then there's the regulation of degeneration. Okay? Now, when we say we're going to treat the degenerative process, we're not going to treat now the underlying molecular problem at, caused by the gene mutation. We're just going to stop the degeneration. That'd be pretty cool, you know? Uh, and there are, there's a, there are, are a, a lot, there's a lot of research to, to, that's underway that in animals has been made huge gains. Um, so, uh, that's another target. And the other thing is that if, if, along these lines is maybe we're just going to facilitate nerve transmission of injured nerves, or we're going to facilitate nerve outgrowth of injured nerves. So we're not going to actually stop the degeneration, we're just going to augment recovery even though we haven't stopped the underlying disease process. That's not also a possibility. And things like Ampira, that's what it's supposed to do, is to improve the conduction through partially demyelinated fibers. It doesn't stop, it doesn't remyelinate, it doesn't stop the disease process, it just is supposed to facilitate transmission in injured fibers. Okay, what about treating symptoms? Great, let's do it. What about spasticity? Okay, let's take a look at spasticity. You know, uh, for all of uh, the amount of time we spend talking about spasticity, we don't, I don't know that much about spasticity's biochemistry. It's an intense area of research. We use, uh, you know, baclofen or baclofen pumps or dantrium or tizanidine, Botox, um, the, 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 there's a rich um, literature evolving research on the biochemistry of spasticity. It has to do with upregulation of various neurotransmitters within the interneurons within the spinal cord following upper motor neuron injury. Upper motor neuron injury causes a change in the neurochemical milieu within the spinal cord, which is, contributes to spasticity. One of the agents, for example, is a serotonin receptor. That's the 5-HT2A um, receptor. And modulating that reduces spasticity. Well, that's a different approach than the um, benzodiazepine approach through baclofen and, and so forth. So we need to, if we're going to treat spasticity as the primary problem, we need to do our homework and learn about um, the uh, neurochemical changes caused by, by the upper motor neuron problem. For example, we can't yet stop Parkinson's, but we can replace an important chemical deficiency, L-DOPA. What if there was a similar chemical replacement that stopped the spasticity? It didn't stop the condition, it just treated the spasticity as effectively. Well, it's not stopping the condition, so it's not exactly what we want, but it would help us for a period of time until we got what we wanted, which is to stop the underlying condition and promote recovery. Okay, now, what about weakness? I mean, we could talk about this, but this is really important because um, in, in related conditions, the thing that predicts, the single factor that predicts the ability to walk is not spasticity, but it's hip flexor weakness. And so we weakness is really important. And, um, you know, uh, Anita Harding, who was a pioneer, I mean, just want to mention that name because she, she was a, um, a, a wonderful person um, and a geneticist from England, and she initially divided up HSP into complicated and uncomplicated and type 1 and type 2. And... Uh, she wrote that the difference, dif there were major differences within HSP between those people who had major weakness and people who didn't have major weakness. And the ability to walk was retained uh, best in people who didn't have major weakness. And uh, so this goes back into the late 70s. And this is 
I'm, I'm really impressed by that knowledge back then and taking it very seriously. What causes weakness in HSP? Well, you know, it's upper motor neuron. OK, that's all good. Yeah, but if you really ask, now I'm talking to the neurologists, but if you really get into it, there's a lot of proximal weakness, which is not so typical um, in, in people that are profoundly weak. Not everybody, but some people have profound weakness, and they have a lot of proximal weakness. And that's not the typical distribution of, uh, of a pure upper motor neuron lesion, which raises the possibility that there is more involvement, such as anterior horn cells, which are sometimes involved in HSP, and interneurons, which haven't been studied well in HSP, I think we need to take a look at the weakness. Because for, for some people, weakness is the major problem. And right now, the best thing we can say is resistance exercises. OK. Now, what about, um, what about this concept of neuroplasticity? When I watch somebody walk, when anybody watches somebody walk, we're watching, or any, we're watching the consequences of the, of the disorder. We're seeing how the disorder has affected the nervous system. And simultaneously, we're seeing how the nervous system is compensating. As soon as there is nerve degeneration, there's the nervous system is compensating the, to the best extent possible. We don't think in HSP and PLS that compensation is primarily um, broken. And, and some of the evidence is that people that have HSP and PLS who then have a stroke or other injury don't have different outcomes. This is just anecdotal observation. Don't have a more profound or prolonged. They have the same type of course, including recovery, from other neurotrauma or stroke specifically. And so in general, we think that the ability to compensate for the nervous system to modify itself in the presence of ongoing impairment, we think that that is happening in HSP and PLS. So the moment that the instant we, we conceptualize, the instant that the degeneration starts, well, the other neurons perceive there's a problem and start compensating. That's what they do. That's how, what neurons, how they behave. This, we know this happens in animal models, in mice and in cats, that when you make a lesion of the upper motor neurons, you induce neuroplastic or compensatory changes of the downstream neurons. Uh, and we, so these are studies that have been shown in animals and, we, uh, and, and in humans to some extent, not experimentally. So, um, it, very important. OK, got it. Uh, they're telling me I'm just about one minute to go. OK. So uh, if we could understand this process, this compensation that the body is doing, maybe we could augment it as a way of slowing down the, the, the condition or stopping the condition at an early stage. OK. Now, I want to move past this. We, these are my to-do list. I think we need better animal models, natural history studies, and so forth. I'm going to skip past this in the interest of time. I've shown this slide before, but maybe not to everybody here. What's wrong with this calf? Calf's alive. The uh, calf is born, unable to stand, OK? And this calf has uh, bovine hereditary spastic paraplegia. This is a, a naturally occurring condition in, the American brown Swiss, in a, in a sp strain of American brown Swiss. This is a genetic mutation in the cattle, in the bovine spastin gene, OK? Now, I'm showing this for a couple reasons. One. Um, in, um, this is a great animal model to be tested. Mice are not so good, in my opinion. Rats, mice. I mean, they all have limitations. They all have a value, and they have limitations. But this is a large, vet a large vertebrate animal that is suitable for gene therapy studies or stem cell studies or so forth. The other point to make, besides that it's a good animal model, uh, I guess, is that it's extremely expensive. The reason we haven't started studies, gene therapy trials in these cattle is just the cost, not the lack of technology. 
not lack of access to the animals, just it's too expensive. Um, and the third point is that in, in cattle, this is a demyelinating disorder. In humans, it's an axon disorder. So the point I'm making is when you look at animal models, animal, every animal model has to be judged on the, to the extent that it validly reflects the human condition. And in cattle, this is a demyelinating disorder. In humans, it's an axon di disorder. So if we, if we say, well, mice behave a certain way, we have to wonder, do the, are the mice a valid model of the human condition? I'm just using this as an example. OK, now, in the last slide, I want to just mention, if we were to develop clinical trials, and this is just a concept. I'm throwing this out as an idea as an opening suggestion, and we can entertain other ideas, I would consider picking, if we're going to develop trials for hereditary spastic paraplegia and PLS, I would not go for the most common type of HSP or PLS. I would go for the one that's most amenable to study, and however rare it is. And the criteria I would use is that there are known biomarkers. Pick a type of HSP and PLS or PLS that has known biomarkers. Pick a type that there's a really good animal model. Hopefully, there's multiple, more than one animal model um, to compare between them. Pick a type in which there is robust cell model, cell culture models. And pick a type for which there are already FDA-approved therapies that look promising for that type. If you find if this is what you want to, if we're going to try treatment, we should go for the low-hanging fruit of the treatment types because we want to develop, as I say in the top part here, sustainable research. Sustainable research means you get a project, you get it off the ground, you get another grant, it gets funded, you expand your research, you get another grant. That's what it means, sustainable research. Not that it was a great idea and the project worked, but it was too expensive and you couldn't keep continuous funding for it. That's not sustained. So we want to get, we want to take a, we want to get success in a test case and use that as leverage for other types of HSP. So part of this is a scientific approach and part of this is a political funding uh, approach. I'm putting the two together to go for a type of HSP that might have the greatest chance of developing sustainable funding that would allow other types of HSP to be tested in time, some of the more complex types, which are some of the more common types. So there are a number of types, adrenal myelinopathy, SPG5, perhaps SPG78, SPG47. These are types that have fairly well-defined or emerging biomarkers. And that's why I picked them. But there are others, and this is just discussion. OK. Great. Thank you. <laughs>